department of space and uh, sari was the chairman space commission and uh, sari is now a distinguished advisor department of space and isro lot many other laurels are there behind him now uh, children we, you please listen to sir and whatever the doubts you have immediately you can put it on your chat box or else you just send it to our um, uh, mobile then accordingly we will put forward your question to sir now i request uh, madam uh, uh, sripadi sandi principal jnv uh, north sikkim north sikkim madam to just uh, play that uh, formal uh, welcome address to our sir thank you madam thank you yes sir good evening to all of you good evening sir i take the opportunity to give a very very small welcome speech on behalf of navodaya vidyalaya samiti and 58 jnv is implementing vigyan jyoti project i hereby take the opportunity to welcome dr radhakrishnan the story of india's space history and its achievements will remain incomplete sir without mentioning you dr radhakrishnan honored with padma bhushan is well known and acknowledged for his contributions in chandrayaan 1 and mangalyaan projects dr radhakrishnan hails from irinyalakuda a small town in trishur district kerala he studied electrical engineering in government engineering college trishur and did his post graduate studies at indian institute of management bangalore between 74 to 76 he obtained his doctorate from iit kadatpur Dr Radhakrishnan's long journey in Indian Space Research Organization starting in May 1971 as a design and development engineer of electromechanical devices at Vikram Sarabhai Space Center Tiruvannandapuram is intertwined with the success story of India's space achievements he has served as project director and set up regional remote sensing service centers at Bangalore Nagpur, Kadakpur, Jodhpur and Dehradun for capacity building in central and state government agencies. He subsequently took up as director of National Remote Sensing Agency and propelled the NRSA to figure among premier agencies and also to serve as the nerve center of ISRO's disaster management support program. In his most prestigious position as India's space chief in the role of chairman ISRO Dr Radhakrishnan led ISRO to achieve 37 space missions these included 20 spacecraft missions 15 launch vehicle missions and experimental flight of LVM3 launcher carrying an unmanned crew module during his tenure ISRO completed two joint satellite missions with French National Space Agency and in another with NASA some of the notable and creditable achievements of dr radhakrishnan are redefining the chandrayaan 2 mission with indigen lander and rover teaming planning and executing of mars orbiter mission also called as mangalyaan at a low cost of 4.5 billion indian rupees india's success is in reaching planet mars in its maiden attempt and we are all indebted to you sir a recipient of several national and international awards dr radhakrishnan is a trained kathakali artist a performer on stage and also a trained carnatic vocalist a very very hearty welcome on behalf of navodaya vidyalaya samiti and on behalf of 58 schools implementing vigyan jyoti project sir welcome sir thank you thank, thank you so much can i have the presentation on the screen yes sir yeah. yes ah sir okay principal shri kannan joint commissioner ms shanti and all my dear students who are listening to this program i will take a few minutes and talk to you about outer space and the prospects 
and possibilities in the new space age. Now, what is this outer space? If you look up to the sky, you will see all those beautiful stars there. And we call this universe. And still, the humankind is trying to understand more and more about this universe. And one of the objectives of all the scientists in the world is to understand about this expanding universe, the galaxies, the stars, sun, the planets, the moon, and more about the earth in which we are living and about the life on earth. Scientists are also trying to find out whether life is available in any form in other planets. So this is one part of the study of outer space. Now, if you look up and see an aircraft flying, which goes at a height of about 10 kilometer above the earth. Scientists call that an area where you have atmosphere. And as we go up, the density of the air comes down. Around 100 to 120 kilometers above the earth, the density of the air will be significantly low. And that point is what distinguishes the people who deal with aerodynamics and people who are in the research on outer space. They call it astronautics. So essentially, the region between 120 kilometers above the Earth to the entire universe is the outer space. Can I have the next slide? Now, I will just show you a few pictures, which you are familiar with, of course. What India has done in this area over the last few decades. I use the word new space age. Before that itself, there was a term called modern space age. That is when in 1957, the Soviets, the Russians were able to put a satellite around Earth using a very powerful rocket. Soon America also did the same. And that marked a new phase in the history of space, science, and technology. Many things happened in the world, especially in America, in Soviet Union or Russia, in Europe, in China, Japan, Canada, and India too. India joined space in 1962. And what we have in front of you is the father of Indian space program, Dr. Vikram Sarabhai, who started this activity at Tumba. Tumba is very close to Tiruvannandapura in Kerala. Why Tumba is also a scientific question. The magnetic equator passes through Tumba, among several other places in the world. <coughs> and the scientists were interested in understanding more and more about the upper atmosphere. 
20, 30, 40 kilometers above the earth using small rockets, which go like a projectile that you have studied in your physics class. A small rocket, 30 to 40 kilogram mass, takes off, goes like a projectile. As it reaches the higher altitudes, instruments are used to measure several parameters in the atmosphere. That's called sounding. They are sounding rockets. So this is what India started with in 1963 from Tumba, from a fishing hamlet. It's a small village near Tiruvannathapur. And you see what happens in the next 50 years and where India reached in the next 50 years. Next one. Next slide. This is what India did in the year 2030. 1963, we were able to send a small sounding rocket. But in 2013, India made the Mars Orbiter spacecraft, which is famously known as Mangalyan. We launched it with our own PSLV that happened in November 2013. And it was a long voyage of nearly 650 million kilometers. It took almost 300 days to reach there. Precisely, we were able to take it there and capture that orbit. This was considered a major achievement for India, historical achievement. And it also showed to the rest of the world that at a low budget, we can do an interplanetary mission. What picture that you see here is the launch complex which we have in Sriharikota, the east coast of India. And the PSLV is just taking off. And this is what we famously call the rocket science. All branches of engineering, physics, chemistry, mathematics, all are essential. And thousands of scientists, technologists, technicians come to the, together to realize such a mission. Can I have the next one? Next. This is the picture of a satellite at close distance. We use the word satellite or we use the word spacecraft, both interchangeable. What you see is a satellite being tested in the URL Satellite Center at Bangalore before moving it to Sri Kota for the launch. The rocket takes about 20 minutes to put the satellite into the orbit. But this satellite has to be there functioning well for the next five to 10 years. And what one can do is only to send a few commands from the ground. The rest of the activity has to be done by the satellite itself. And it has to go through the severe space environment, like the temperature. On one side, it may be very hot. The other side, it may be very cool, but still, all the systems have to function well. There will be radiation coming from the space and all the electronic devices should be able to function in the face of this radiation. And you will be seeing those black panels. They are there to collect energy from sun. And that is where the satellite gets its power. 
Occasionally, when that is not available, there will be battery to do that. There will be several mechanisms inside, and they all have to function in this space environment for many years. So all that has to be ascertained well before in the laboratory. So designing a satellite is important. Making it is important. Testing it is important. And finally, reaching it to the orbit. And when you talk about orbit and the voyage to the orbit, there's a lot to be done by the mathematicians there. A lot has to be done by the engineers and scientists involved. And what these satellites are for? They are for several purposes. One, for communication. If you take an orbit of 36,000 kilometer above the Earth, Satellite will take almost 24 hours for one revolution. That means for a person looking at from the Earth, the satellite will be stationary because you know that Earth also takes 24 hours. We call it geostationary satellite. That is with respect to us on the ground, the satellite looks relatively stationary. And if you have several such satellites, we can have communication. And they are like post there for receiving signals from the earth and also transmitting it to where you want it. So communication or broadcasting, the TV signals that you are getting now, they all come through such communication satellites at 36,000 kilometers. And there is an instrument called transponder, which works in different frequency bands. It's a very complex electronic equipment. You see the pictures of the clouds on the TV, in the newspaper. And such pictures are used by the weather scientists to see whether the cyclonic system is coming or what is going to happen for the weather. And these are also satellites with instruments for specific meteorological observations at that altitude. There is another class of satellites called remote sensing satellites. All of us are doing remote sensing when we see somebody else from a distance, we see a person and make conclusions about who he, she, is how they are, etc. Cameras kept in the satellites positioned at about 500 to 600 kilometers above the earth can look at the natural resources, the paddy fields, the forest, the water periodically and give us data about its health, about the change. So they are required for understanding about the natural resources. They also give information about various objects. And they put them around the earth and they pass through the north and south poles. That means in one period, it can take pictures of any part of the globe global remote sensing satellite system. There is another class of satellites called navigation. If you have four satellites in the orbit, and if you can find out the delay of a signal reaching that satellite and back from a point, you can solve certain equations and find out the coordinates and the time. So if you are in a moving vehicle, and if you get good signals from four such satellites, they are called navigation satellites, position can be obtained. Famously, these days, we use GPS system, Global Positioning System. So there will be a constellation of around 25 satellites around the globe, and at least four 
will be visible to any one of us and then we can make these measurements. And what you are seeing in this picture is India's navigation satellite system called NAVIC, which we have placed. It is in an orbit which is 36,000 kilometers. So over this period of five decades, India started making satellite in 1975. And as of now, we have made more than 100 satellites of different kinds. From a small sounding rocket, we started moving to SLV-3 and then PSLV, GSLV, GSLV Mark three. We have an operational set of launch vehicles. Next picture. Next. This is a typical scene in a ground station from where all the satellites in the orbit are controlled. So this is the nerve center of that network. And all over the globe, there will be ground stations with large antenna systems. They will be sending commands to the satellites, receiving commands from the satellites, receiving information about its health, data, and then analyze. Like you have the patients in the intensive care unit, for each satellite, there will be a team of scientists and technicians and engineers looking at each one of these satellites and they take corrective actions whenever the satellite gets into the block. Next to Next to see. This is what Principal Mr. Kannan was explaining. When we started the space program in India, many people were asking, why are we getting into the space program, which is very costly. The answer was, the space system, satellites are required to understand the natural resources, get communication, to support education, to help the common man, to help the development process in this country. So it is a people-centric, society-centric program. On the left side of the slide, there are so many pictures. You see forests there. Forests are inaccessible. If you want to find out what is happening in the forest, trees are getting cut or fire is taking place. It is difficult to go there and find out, but satellites can get this information very well, very fast. If you want to look at the agricultural fields, and even forecast what is going to be the production, it can be done. If you want to know about the water resources, satellite will give information. If you want to understand more and more about the groundwater, availability of groundwater, where you can dig a well to get water, satellite will give you certain information useful for that purpose. When there is a flooding, satellites are best friends to help us to find out the inundation. When there is a cyclone, which happens every year, especially in the east coast of India, these meteorological satellites will provide information at least two days in advance that a system is coming and where that system is going to finally land can be calculated very precisely and the local government can take evacuation measures and we save every year many, many lives. This is one of the applications of the system. If you look at the communication infrastructure, data connectivity, education, broadcasting, all these areas in India, we see the impact of satellite systems. Today, there are nearly 50 Indian satellites in the orbit, which are providing all these services. Can I have the next one? 
Next slide, please. Now we will come to the topic. We use the word new space age for various reasons. In 1957, when the modern space age started, there were only very few countries involved participating in the space activities. But now there are about 70 nations engaged in the space activities. Not only the governments, but there are several commercial agencies and almost 75% of the activity is done by the commercial agencies. Earlier, the governments were investing. Today, individuals like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, they are all the major investors in the space activity. And they are looking at moon, they are looking at Mars and such frontier areas. There are several new startups which have come up. The younger generation who are inspired to get into the space activity. Why all this in the West? That is what we are going to see in the next few slides. Next. Next. On one side, we talk about the galaxy, stars, solar system, planets, moon. Humankind would like to know more about it, more knowledge about us. And there are areas like astronomy, astrophysics, cosmology, on which the humankind has been working for centuries. Earlier, it was ground-based observatories. But now, we are able to use spacecraft, space observatories, to study these systems. It is called space exploration. Very interesting. multi wavelength observatory in space. There is a Hubble telescope, which is very famous. There is a telescope which is going to come soon called James Webb Telescope. These are all to look at the galaxies. Now, there is a mission to look at the sun. It's called heliophysics. There is a Parker solar probe, which is launched by NASA, Americans, and which is making a lot of observations. India is getting into the Aditya mission in the near future. So this is looking at the sky and getting more and more information. If you look at the Chandrayaan one that we had launched in the year 2008, that is to look at our moon. Chandrayaan 2 is also an orbiter which is functioning. And we also wanted to put a lander which did not work there. We are going with a new mission, Chandrayaan 3, for that purpose. If you look at the other countries, they all have gone to observe several of these planets in the solar system. And in Mars, a few lander rover systems have already been there. So this is an area of work. Physics, more, and more understanding, and these areas of activity. A very exciting field. In India, there are many laboratories who work for these kinds of observations and generating scientific knowledge. Physical Research Laboratory in Ahmedabad, National Physical Laboratory, the Ayuka in Pune, Tata Institute of Fundamental Research, Indian Institute of Astrophysics. These are some of the major national laboratories and ISRO for that. In the bottom, I have put a set of things as I explained earlier. Constellation of satellites orbiting Earth. 
This is another area. This is for people-centric, human-centric activities for governance and for national security. And all those details I gave you, communication, broadcasting, education, data connectivity, meteorological observation, weather forecasting, climate studies, position, remote sensing, etc. How this become important? You require a large number of satellites. As of now, in the whole world, if you look at, there are about 2,500 operating satellites doing these activities. So to build those satellites, to operate that sat those satellites, and to provide the services to the ultimate user is a very big business. It is called space enterprise. And they use a the term space asset. Like we have assets on ground, these are assets in space. And these assets have to be protected. And like we have problems of protecting assets on Earth, there are problems in the space also. There are so many debris or small parts which will be going around hitting these satellites. So one has to take care of that. And if you are dependent on these satellites, you have to ensure that nobody attacks them. So these are all the complexities when we use satellites for our own daily purposes. Then if you have to put these satellites into the orbit, you require powerful rockets. We have three types of rockets today, PSLV, GSLV, GSLV Mark III. Number wise, the GSLV Mark III can put a satellite of four ton into a geostationary orbit. Or into a low Earth orbit, around 1,000 kilometer orbit, we can put about 10 to 12 ton. Other countries also have powerful rockets. They use it for various of these applications. Next. Next. There are new avenues coming up. Solar power is becoming important. And as of now in the world, about 1% of the total energy is taken from the solar power. Solar power is collected on the ground. You can see large array of solar panels, some of them mounted on the instruments, but these are collected on the earth. Scientists and engineers are looking at whether we can have solar power platforms in the space so that they can collect it and then they can transfer it to the earth. When we are looking at going to moon and Mars, etc., there is also an opportunity of bringing back some of those precious resources back to earth. It's called mining, space mining. This is coming up. This may be a reality in the next three, four decades. We all know about the human in space. Americans landed in moon. And we also have a program, the Kenyan at the moment, to take two or three astronauts to the space and bring them back safely. This is a new dimension of the space exploration. And it is very complex. It involves also study of the behavior of the human being in space, in zero gravity, for a long duration in the space environment, and all the safety associated with that. Today, the International Space Station provides such an opportunity for those who want to conduct experiments. And there are also plans by several countries to go back again to moon and try to see whether we can go to Mars. And typically, a travel to Mars and back will take about 1,000 days. That means a human being should be prepared to be in that environment for 1,000 days. And in all these missions, you require 
new instruments to require very versatile satellites and powerful rockets. We talk about mining of celestial resources. And if you want to bring 10 kilogram or 10 ton, let us say, from Mars, we need to be able to send at least 250 to 300 tons to the orbit first. That means you must have a very, very, very powerful rocket. And the associated ground equipment. Lastly, in all these areas, why we are talking about today is this require a lot of advances in applied sciences, in engineering, in mathematics, in astrobiology, in bioastronautics, and also the three areas which I mentioned, astronomy, astrophysics, and cosmology. This is a challenge. And these developments provide you one, with knowledge. Second, it is useful for the humanity, for the society. Three, it also enhances the economy. So it's very important area. And those of you who are in the 11th and 12th should aspire to get into the space activities and contribute to the country. I was like you in the 1960s and I started my career in Israel in 1971. Today, 50 years later, if I look back, I feel I took a right decision to get into the space program. It's very challenging. And you have to be a student every day. Something new has to be learned every day. And work as a team. And in the future, it will be not only the teams in your own laboratories or the sister institutions in the country, but you will be working with the global community looking at the celestial bodies, looking at what you can do for humanity and know more about the origin of humanity. Thank you. I will stop at this point of time and probably we will have a few questions. Okay, sir. Thank you. Uh, uh, children, children, if you go, any doubt, please. Nava Baskar, sir, anything collected? Mr. Nava Baskar? Okay. Sir, sir I, wanna, yes. I have my own doubt, it's a small doubt. Yes. Sir, it is ISRO having capacity to build indigenous engines, even cryogenic engines to launch the satellites. Yeah. Uh, is it possible to develop an engine indigenously for our own aviation programs? It is possible and in the country we have done it. For example, the Light Combat Aircraft Project, LCA, Sir. was initiated in the 80s and there was a program to develop our own engine called Kaveri engine. Sir. That Kaveri engine is developed and it has Sir. gone through almost all qualification tests. It's a very complex engine. Okay. And that engine has to be used for the aircraft, which has to run for several years, actually. Sir, Long sir, sir. duration of journey. So qualification process is quite complex. Okay. Now, what was envisaged in the 80s and what is the requirement today? Sir. Change because we need more powerful systems, actually. Sir, sir. So there is also a program in DRDO sir. to develop modern in okay. fact, okay. okay. there is an institution called GTR, Gas Turbine Research Institute. Okay, sir. They have okay. done. Sir, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir.
Good evening, sir. Ah, please. Good evening, sir. sir. I'm happy to ask you a question. Sir, we are using GPS. It is developed by America, sir. But why can't... Uh, but uh, Russia and China also developed a separate GPS type. Why can't India develop that, sir? Why can't we have our okay. own GPS? In, India has developed its own. It's called navigation system. As I told, if you have signal from four satellites, we yeah. can find out about the three coordinates and time. So America's GPS was the first one, global positioning system. Russia has their GLONA system. Europe has Galileo system. These are all global. We can make use of all these systems and get information. It is possible. But as you told, there are occasions when those countries may not give that signal to us. So it was essential for India to develop that capability. And India decided to have a regional navigation satellite system. With seven satellite constellation, we can get signals for India and the surrounding region. Seven satellite constellation is already there today. It's called NAVIC. Thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. Now, Paskarji, please. Sir. Yes. So, uh, uh, good afternoon, sir. And just I wanted to know the differences between the astrobiology and astronautic. In what way these two words uh, vary, sir, in different ways? See, basically, uh, first, the difference between aerodynamics and astronautics. They are the two terms to be compared. Aerodynamics is talking about the studies below 120 kilometer. That is where air is the prominent uh, medium. And above that, it becomes astronautics. Okay. Astrobiology talks about the life in the other celestial bodies, etc. Sir, as you said, there, there is a, it is helpful for the weather indication. I mean, suppose the percentage of a carbon dioxide or anything, to what extent this is sensitive, the sensors are there, we can change in the environmental condition, we can know it. Not change, monitor. Monitor, just only monitor. The, uh, weather is one aspect. Sir. Next one is about the environment. The third is about, yeah, third is about the climate. Can I have the, okay, we can talk like that. So when we talk about climate, the IPCC, the International Panel on Climate Change, have identified about 50 parameters related to atmosphere, related to land, related to ocean. And several of these parameters are best measured using satellite system because satellites give a synoptic coverage. It can make periodic measurements. And those instruments also could be of the similar nature so that you can make intercomparisons, the change. And these changes are going to be minute. So there are several instruments in the remote sensing satellite system which look at land. There are several instruments which look at the ocean specifically. And there are instruments which look at the atmospheric parameters also. Spectrometry is one such thing. And when we look at the Mars also, those atmosphere are studied. Sir, as I said, the commercial agency, which consists of 75% of almost all the activities, especially in the space, space activities, is, uh, we can say, any uh, threat perception price, especially in the defense and security area, so that they can find out there are, two aspects of it. there are two aspects of it. One is, if you look at the global space economy, about 75% of that is contributed by the commercial operation of satellite systems, building of satellite systems, launching them commercially, and a huge activity on using the satellites for downstream services. That is one aspect of it. The other aspect that you are talking today is using 
the satellites for strategic applications. Yes, if you can look at the paddy fields and terrain in our country, the satellites are global. They can observe in any part of the globe. It's an open sky policy. So you can make conclusions about what is happening in your neighborhood. That means these satellites can be used for surveillance. It's very important. And today a new area is also coming up in militarization where space systems are playing a role. But the threat is when we depend on the satellites for our daily activities, we have to ensure that they are safe in the orbit. And that threat comes from a couple of possibilities. So one, physically, can somebody damage it? Or electronically, somebody can damage it? Or the thousands of bodies which are going around in the orbit, the spin parts, disintegrated parts of old satellites, can they come and collide with our satellites, operational satellites? How to handle that? Now, these are all the subjects of today, space asset management. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Uh, children, any other question? Uh, sir, one, one more doubt, sir. So the other day, Dr. Anil Kagurkar was with us. He was talking about the security of our nation. Uh, he was just promising our security is assured because India has the capacity to deploy even the nuclear submarines. Now, the thing is, is it possible to have nuclear air bus, sir, so that your security will be highly strengthened? Nuclear right. air bus is absolutely not for striking, but to uh, enhance our security. And just to keep it uh, ready in the space, having the capacity of striking at any place in no time. Yes, See, sir. sir. There are related issues. When you yeah. use a nuclear device in the space system, not essentially for the purpose that you mentioned, but if you look at a deep space mission, we require nuclear devices there to operate them for a longer time. Typically, for the Chandrayaan lander, if we use our normal batteries that we use in the satellites, we can operate only for one lunar day, that is 14 days. If you have to make it alive for more number of days, we require radioactive devices. Similarly, for temperature management, thermal management, so it is required. The difficulty there is, as it takes off from the Earth, if it goes to the orbit and remain there, we have no problem. But if it doesn't, it comes back to Earth. What happens to the safety of the human beings? So this is the global issue. So in the UN agency, which is associated with this activity, the Committee on Peaceful Use of Outer Space, every country is worrying about this. What are the guidelines to be issued? So what happens if the satellite doesn't go to the orbit or it gets into a problem and comes back to the orbit? So there is a safety question involved in that, even for a small device. It goes, sir. That's true. That's true. Okay, sir. Thank you, sir. Children, any other question? If not, uh, uh, sir, my uh, deputy commissioner from uh, regional office, Hyderabad, is waiting uh, to just to propose a word of thanks to thank you. you. Thank you. Thank uh, you. Sir, Kopal Ashton, kindly, please, sir. Carry on, sir. Please, sir. sir. Good evening, sir. Good evening. Good evening, sir. Sir, it has been a very, very invigorating experience for all, of us, for all of us, sir. And the message coming from you that one has to be a student every day is the biggest message that all of us are receiving from you. And such great weighty matters 
related to space science and technology in a very very simple words even the people without science background we are able to understand and appreciate and naturally this must be a very very stimulating experience for the children to explore their careers in the area of uh, space science and technology the main purpose for which we have requested your august uh, delivery of lecture to our children right and sir each word that you have said about space science and technology how it is it is not a stand alone subject and how it is linked with human lives environment everything that is there on earth is very very inspiring and i am sure the children almost 250 children across the country they are all mesmerized and they are all watching your uh, presentation and listening to you with utmost interest and the objective for which you could spare your valuable time uh, in this lecture is fully uh, fulfilled sir and we are very thankful to you grateful to you and this is only a beginning and people like scientists of your caliber and uh, versatile uh, personalities like you can play a very very um, uh, impactful uh, influence on the children and as you are aware now they are students who are mostly selected from the rural uh, areas uh, they deserve this kind of exposure as you have explained about uh, space exploration career exploration is a very crucial thing for any child if we can connect a child with the right job according to the uh, brilliance and the interest the child has i think that would be the greatest purpose the education system would be serving in the country and we are very grateful to you sir for having spared your valuable time i thank kannan for having arranged such a wonderful uh, lecture for our uh, children thank you very much sir thank you so much thank you thank you mr ranj anything more to share sir thank you very much wish you all the best thank you sir you we are highly thank interested you. to you thank you